taking over. Tomorrow on ET, our American Idol exclusive. Welcome to Friendship. The Idol Fab Four interview each other. Kevin, Michelle, we might be taking your job. Ooh. Oh, we can trade. We'll Today. get your American Idol. Yes, we will. Absolutely, but if they come for our jobs, Kev, we're not getting them back. <laughs> Before we go, Jamie Lee Curtis is getting the ultimate round of applause with tributes from her pals at Paw Works Animal Rescue. Mrs. Wang, are you with us? This happening now. This medical facility, formerly known as Southwest General Hospital, announcing it will be closing after nearly 40 years of operation. How some clients and even some employees are reacting. I'm afraid I cannot make it. And he said, ma'am, you gotta make it because we're gonna die up here. Coming up, residents rescued from the third floor of the Blanco apartments tell us their frightening moments before firefighters rescued them. And by about this time tomorrow, a cold front's gonna pay us a visit, causing some noticeable changes. We'll get into that along with our increasing storm chance in just a bit. The News at 5 starts right now. Is it a blow to medical care on the south side? First at five today, after nearly 40 years in business, Texas Vista Medical Center on the south side is shutting down. The facility used to be known as Southwest General Hospital. Jonathan Cotto across the street from that hospital. He joins us live. All right, Jonathan, a couple of questions here. This is the only hospital to serve the south side. How are people reacting to this news? And perhaps more importantly, what will the impact be in all this? Steve, that's right. You know, the people we spoke to here today are not happy and the owners of the hospital uh, say that some of the reasons that they are closing down are due to financial issues and um, other problems that we didn't didn't get into specifics. But I can tell you that the, spoke, the people we spoke to here today say that if this hospital closes, people will be left without jobs and others without uh, quick access to health care. I really hope it's not true. And if it is true, I hope somebody please um, help us out. Come, come save this little hospital. It's a jewel. Stewart Healthcare, the owners of Texas Vista Medical Center, announcing the hospital will be closing down as of May 1st. We've come a long way over the last several years when Stewart took over. Um, the level of care has increased significantly. And yeah, I, I just think it's a, it's a shame. The 342 bed medical facility formerly known as Southwest General Hospital is the only of its kind to serve more than 175 patients on the city's south side. Without it, Robert says it'll have a negative impact on this community. It allows them to stay close to their family uh, so that they're not having to travel to downtown or even to the medical center or up to uh, the far north side or east side. My dad, he lives in this area. Tiffany Sanchez is visiting her father who is a patient at Texas Vista and says she grew up on the south side and says it's more than just a building. It's a helpful and caring place. I mean, gosh, I remember even being a kid and having a cold and coming and knowing that I was going to feel better after. So it's, it's yeah, it's pretty, um, it's pretty heartbreaking, actually, now that I think about it. There are also over 800 people who work here. Another concern, the economic impact. That's cleaning, that's clinical, non-clinical. The thing that really is a big part of this hospital that people are, that may miss out on is the psychiatric services here. Now, the president of Texas Vista Medical Center says they don't want to close down and are still hopeful that another entity can assume control of operations. Coming up at six, we'll talk to you about why this, this hospital is so important and how it serves this community. Reporting live, Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jonathan. It was breaking news on the night beat. Several people rescued after a fire inside one apartment. Now, dozens of people are without a home and their belongings. It's all because of smoke damage. This happened last night at the Blanco Apartments on West Wiesatch, north of downtown. Two people were taken to the hospital. Fortunately, many others did make it out safely. Camelia Juarez joins us live from that apartment complex. Camelia, is there a sign or any answer as to when people might be able to return to their apartments? Steve Myra Opportunity Home, formerly known as the San Antonio Housing Authority, 
says it could take up to two weeks before some of these people can come back home. At least 72 people are staying at, ho at hotels at the moment. But here's what we know so far. San Antonio Fire Chief Charles Hood says the fire started on a mattress inside, the thir inside a third floor apartment. SAFD does not believe the fire was intentionally set. The flames were contained to that apartment, but smoke from the fire caused a lot of damage. Opportunity Home says the third and fourth floors also have a lot of soot buildup on the walls. We spoke with one woman who says she became aware of the fire when she smelt smoke coming into her room. Then it quickly escalated. Then all of a sudden I said, what's that? Smoke. Could it be coming from an apartment? No. There was more smoke. I started yelling for the neighbor. Where are you? Where are you? There's smoke. There's smoke. I opened the front door and it threw me back. The black smoke threw me back. Belton was one of several people, including a 98-year-old woman who was rescued from the third floor and their balconies. Many of the people we spoke with say they're still waiting to be able to get their belongings from the inside. Now, Red Cross is assisting in this case. They're handing out toiletries, helping people on a case-by-case -case basis. And coming up at 6, we'll tell you more about how residents are holding up after this very frightening fire. Reporting live, Camelia Juarez, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Camelia. We have new details about a man found dead inside a burning apartment. He's been identified as Francisco Javier Ramirez Jr. He was 54 years old. Right now, we're still working to learn the cause of his death from the Bear County Medical Examiner investigating Ramirez's body after it was found yesterday. After firefighters put out flames inside that apartment on Barrington, that's where they found the body. He had several gunshot wounds to the chest. Yesterday, SAPD had not arrested anyone. We asked them for an update. They haven't provided us any details as of airtime. Meantime, still working to learn the name of a man shot and killed overnight. This happened on North San Ignacio Street around 4 this morning. San Antonio police say a group of four men were hanging out in a driveway of a vacant home there. At some point, shots were fired, and a 27-year-old and a 28-year-old man were hit. That 28-year-old died at a hospital. The suspect got away, and at last check, no one had been arrested. San Antonio police need help finding this man. Matthew Williams hasn't been seen in almost a month. According to SAPD, he was last seen February 3rd in the 7400 block of Meadow Breeze Drive. He has gauge piercings in both ears. He's about six foot two. If you have any information on his whereabouts, call SAPD's missing persons unit at 210-207-7660. A jury today finding a man guilty of murder. Leopoldo Mora shot and killed Kenneth Salazar back in 2021 outside of a Westside motel. The prosecution had evidence in this case that included surveillance footage of the shooting and eyewitnesses who identified Mora as the shooter. The jury only took about an hour to come up with their verdict and the punishment phase began this afternoon. Coming up today at six, hear the victim's wife take the stand talking about the kind of person her husband was. A push to change requirements for trains carrying hazardous materials. Cuts coming from the nation's top leaders. As ABC's Lindsay Watts explains, members of Congress introducing a bill that would not only impose stricter safety regulations for railroads, but more financial consequences as well. New images of the aftermath of that fiery train derailment in Ohio. A plume of smoke rising into the sky. The black cloud eventually blanketing the small town of East Palestine. Nearly a month after the crash, a bipartisan group of lawmakers wants new regulations to prevent this devastation in another community. A Senate bill introduced today addresses regulatory issues, including why the state of Ohio didn't know about the hazardous load on the train. Republican J.D. Vance spoke on Fox News. We would make it so that Norfolk Southern and other rail companies have to have to label these trains as high hazardous so that local authorities know what's actually on these trains. Vance and Democrat Sherrod Brown co-sponsored the bill. The senators from Ohio with radically different ideologies finding common ground. Yeah, I don't know Senator Vance well, but he's seeing the same things I'm seeing. He's talking to a lot of the same people I'm talking to. The bill would also set train crews at a two person minimum and require long haul railroads to pay for hazardous materials training for local first responders. The bill introduced one day after another derailment. This one happening Tuesday in Florida, south of Tampa. 
Can you identify the hazardous material? Officials say the train was carrying 30,000 gallons of liquid propane, but so far there has been no leakage. Evacuations could be ordered if that changes. Crews now monitoring the air quality in the area. The bipartisan bill introduced today is called the Railway Safety Act. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer saying it's precisely the kind of bill we need to see in Congress, and he'll work to move it forward for a vote. Lindsay Watts, ABC News, Washington. It breaking right now at 5 o'clock, San Antonio police have made a second arrest in Friday's deadly dog attack. This is 31-year-old Abilene Schneider. She's charged with attack by dangerous dog resulting in death and injury to an elderly person. Her husband, Christian Moreno, was arrested Friday night, hours after the couple's dog killed an 81-year-old man. The dogs have since been euthanized. This is a developing story. We're just gathering information on this. We'll bring you the very latest as it comes into our newsroom. Take a look at traffic out there. In the meantime, I-35 at I-37, you can see in some of the lanes, it's really slow going at 5 o'clock. No big accidents or other roadblocks to tell you about. Just the 5 o'clock commute today. And definitely some humidity to talk about. Feeling sticky and muggy outside with those dew points well into the 60s. As for our high temperature today, we made it up to 88 for the afternoon high, the record being 89. So we were just one degree shy of a very long standing record high held since 1899. It's going to remain in place, but a good 18 degrees above average. 92 Eagle Pass right now, Warren's Backyard, Del Rio, 89, 86 Leon Springs, 92 in Floresville. You get the idea. 80s, some 90s on the map right now. That's going to be changing soon, though, because the cold front will be hitting us about this time tomorrow. But this evening, warm and humid, 80 degrees at 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 74 and then some fog developing again after midnight. Big changes with the cold front. We're going to get into that when it arrives, what it means for wind and storms in just a bit. All right, thank you, Adam. Now to your money. The pharmaceutical company Eli Lilly capping its out-of-pocket cost for insulin at $35. It's also reducing the price of its non-branded insulin to $25 per vial. Right now it's $82 per vial. Insulin, a life-saving drug that millions of Americans rely on, despite being relatively inexpensive to make, the cost has been rising for years and even tripled over an 11-year span, according to the American Diabetes Association. Demand has increased as diabetes has become the fastest-growing chronic disease in the world. All right, when you think about breathing issues, outside allergens and pollutants probably come to mind, but the culprit could be elsewhere like inside your home. Up next, we're gonna show you what to look for and how to get a handle on the problem. In separate encounters, San Marcos police used their stun guns on a man who was deaf and could not hear their commands, and on a second man who was complying with their commands and had his arms raised. An attorney representing both men says the impact of these cases has already been felt outside of the 111 person department. I mean, it costs everyone. When the police abuse someone, you know, that costs city resources to even defend it. Tonight at 6, an in-depth look at the officers tied to these cases and how their narratives of what happened at times contradicted their own footage. Plus, it's about to get more difficult for many families to put food on the table. The federal government ending a policy that gave extra food stamp benefits to millions of people. RJ Marquez tells us how this will affect thousands of families in Bear County and how it will affect the San Antonio Food Bank coming up at six. You say the word pollution and what probably comes to mind industrial smog, smoke, diesel fumes. Well, it turns out indoor air can be worse than the air you breathe outdoors. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz looks at the common culprits and what you can do about it. New homes are more tightly sealed, which helps those heat and AC bills, but it can also mean more indoor pollutants. Where are they coming from? Gas stoves for one. Tests show they can emit toxic gases. So what can you do? Think ventilation. Use your range hood every time you cook and open windows to get the fresh, clean air from the outside in. Other indoor pollutants are VOCs, or volatile organic compounds. They're emitted from cleaning agents, pesticides, aerosols, even couches and carpets. 
spits. Those can irritate throats and eyes and even make people sick. Whenever possible, avoid using harsh chemicals to clean your home. If you can't, again, think of ventilation. Open windows and doors. It can help to buy mattresses and furniture that use natural fibers like cotton. Keep your home dust free using a vacuum with a HEPA filter and clean or change those AC filters. Something else that can help? An air purifier. These Allen, Winix, and Blue Air models got high marks in Consumer Reports tests and run between $275 and $750. Then there's mold, often caused by humidity. It can cause rashes and flu-like symptoms and irritate eyes and lungs. Consider a dehumidifier. Consumer Reports recommends models from Honeywell, Medea, and Home Labs. They run two to three hundred dollars. And finally, carbon monoxide. It can be deadly. Even if you don't have gas appliances, it's recommended to have a carbon monoxide detector on every level of your home. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Look outside with live cam. We've been talking about it all week, waiting on this cold front and the wind. But today, just a gray, warm day out there. Very warm. Yeah, warm then. Was it record warm? Uh, no, we okay. missed it by a degree. One degree shy of the record high, which is held since the late 1800s. How about that? Here, let's go over our weather headlines. So we'll have another round of morning fog tomorrow. A little bit of mist to start the day as well. So some dampness and then some sunshine. Also another warm day well into the 80s. Then as the cold front hits around this time tomorrow, a narrow window for storms to develop and then very gusty winds around that front as well. Let's take a look at the setup where we are now, where that system is, where it's headed. We've got overall a quiet pattern across Texas. Some energy is going to be moving overhead that could kickstart a storm tonight. We'll get into that in a moment, but the main energy is off in the desert southwest. You see the higher elevation snow in blue and the lower elevation rain there. Southern California, Phoenix, and even into parts of Utah. That's the main driving force and energy that's going to be moving our way. Now out ahead of it, a little ripple in the upper level flow, and there is one indication that we could have a few storms develop near the Rio Grande later on tonight. We're talking close to midnight and especially thereafter moving through the hill country by 2 3 a.m. and maybe even clipping northwest Bear County, although it's plausible. I don't think this scenario is exactly likely. We're going to hang around, keep an eye on it for you, but I don't have a whole lot of confidence in this actually materializing tonight. I think we've got higher chances of some storms developing as we get into tomorrow afternoon. Bottom line, the, the morning commute tomorrow, A-OK, -okay, but we'll be around to let you know if anything strong develops overnight tonight while you're sleeping. Otherwise, tomorrow, 8 a.m., the low clouds in place, a little mist and some drizzle and fog afternoon sunshine. This is three o'clock. We see some sun, which will destabilize us a little bit. Then the cold front moves in and with it, we're going to be on the tail end of the activity. I know we say that all the time. That's just the nature of our geography with these types of systems. But five, six o'clock tomorrow, a few storms could develop and then even lasting through about eight, nine o'clock for Bear County and surrounding counties. And it's one of those situations where if we do get a thunderstorm to develop, it would have the chance to become strong to even severe with potentially strong straight line winds and maybe some isolated areas of large hail. We are right on the edge of that severe weather threat, but you notice our friends up in Northeast Texas, Tyler, for example, even Texarkana, it's not just a question of if, but when and how many severe storms they're going to get tomorrow with this potent system moving in. So yeah, we're going to miss out on the heaviest of the rain, but we're not in the main severe weather zone. We're right on the edge of it, so we could have a few pop up, just something we'll monitor, but it's not a slam dunk for severe storms. Actually, you look at the storm chances and it's about 30% for us between 5 p.m. and 9 p.m. 5 to 9 p.m., that's our narrow window, about 30%, but again, what develops could become severe. The key is the wind. We'll have some non-thunderstorm wind gusts up to 50 miles per hour tomorrow evening with this cold front starting around seven, eight o'clock. Notice nine o'clock wind gusts up to 50 miles per hour just west of San Antonio within town, probably 45 mile per hour gusts. So it's going to be howling out there as we get on into about this time tomorrow and especially tomorrow evening. 86 right now, 97 Catula, 95 in Carrizo Springs. We're feeling the warmth tomorrow. 
88 by 4 o'clock, no chance of rain then. Thereafter, 7 o'clock, we're up to a 30% chance becoming very windy and gusty as we've been talking about for days. And then beautiful Friday through the weekend, low humidity, mornings back in the 40s. All right, thank you, Adam. You have to think last night's wind made the plane ride back <laughs> from Utah much more yeah. pleasant than it otherwise would have been. Absolutely. You know, it's such a big win. I probably should have asked for an A block hit today because it's <laughs> been a very long time since the San Antonio Spurs won a game, but they did last night. You know, they are enjoying it. Yes, they stopped that 16 game skid, and UTSA is getting ready for spring football coming up. Yeah, for sure, definitely. It's always a good feeling when, uh, you know, when we win, so it's definitely a great feeling. Kellen Johnson was smiling after the Spurs beat the Jazz in Big Board Sports. The skid is over with. The Spurs won at the Jazz last night, 102-94 to end their 16-game losing streak while closing out the rodeo road trip, 1-8. They also avoided their first ever winless rodeo road trip, and it marked their first and only win in the month of February. A little love for the Spurs to close out the month. Down one with three minutes ago, the Spurs finished out the game with an 8-0 run to put the Jazz to bed. Kelvin Johnson scored six of those points to help the Spurs win their first game since January 17th. Ain't nothing like it, man. I mean, we, you know, we fought. We continue to fight. Um, we stay together as a group, you know, and, um, you know, good things happen. I feel like uh, we had a different, different third quarter than, than what we had uh, last game, you know, and, uh, you know, the guys, you know, they sat down and played defense, man, and, uh, you know, good things happen. But, you know, um, you know, we just got to keep working. Like I said, every time I come here, we get better and better. We had a great shoot around this morning that got us right um, for tonight. It's very competitive. And I think it kind of just set the tone for the day um, that we were, you know, going to come out of here with a win. So just really proud of everyone. Everyone competed. Spurs are back home tomorrow night to host the Pacers at 730. The UTSA football program is all set to start spring practice next week as they prepare for the 2023 season and their first ever in the American Athletic Conference. That's still a long way off, but spring ball will help Coach Trailer and his staff get the new players acclimated to the Roadrunners way of life and the 210 triangle of toughness. Coach knows this is no time to be complacent, though. The future of UTSA football is in their hands right now. We're building a program. And, you know, we've played ball for 12 and competed for 11. We're moving to the AAC. This is a very important time for us. Uh, I think we'll look back historically and look at this upcoming season is obviously to get where we've gotten to in 11 years is pretty remarkable. Um, but I think the trajectory of the program this next year is going to be a big year for us. The team will start spring practice on Monday, one of 15 spring practices allowed by the NCAA. Can I just say Kelvin Johnson was clutch last night? He was clutch, yes. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Larry. Thanks for night. letting me say that. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I asked for permission. Hey, it's your show. Well, hold on now. Okay. Uh-oh. We all know it's Myra's. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> that is all our time. Thanks for watching the News at 5. World News is up next. We'll see you right back here at 6.